orders are simple. Kill as many enemy soldiers as possible, by any means necessary. Three days, 51,000 lives. Making Gettysburg one of the bloodiest battles America will ever know. Exploding shells, musket fire, bullets snapping through the air. It was a scene of horror. 150 years later, hundreds of strange phenomena have been reported more than on any other Civil War battlefield. I saw, standing above the partition door from the waist up, the Confederate soldier staring at me. Out of the white mist walked a soldier. The voice said, I'll shoot you. America is filled with dark and traumatic events. There are some who believe these horrific events leave evidence of what took place. Hot spots filled with unexplained activity. These are the stories of haunted history. The official end of the Battle of Gettysburg was July 3rd, 1863. But visitors to the battlefield tell a different story. They say even though the battlefield looks empty, it's not. Since the war's conclusion, there have been hundreds of reports of unexplained activity. I was walking along a path near the Valley of Death, which is the area between the Devil's Den and Little Round Top. And we started hearing music. We both looked at each other and we said, that's taps. Somebody's playing taps. It was deep in the woods, and what caught my attention was a white fog that started to appear. And out of the white mist walked a soldier. There's another spark. You see what I'm saying? We were just stunned. We couldn't move at all. Look. Isn't it those people? Just walked right by very, very slowly and then just disappeared. Paranormal encounters like this one have been reported throughout Gettysburg for years. But who are these spirits? And what are they telling us about what really happened during those three days at the Battle of Gettysburg? Two years into the Civil War, General Robert E. Lee believes that one decisive win on Northern soil can be the catalyst that will win the war for the South. The Confederate Army had the strong sense that they could defeat the North any place, any time they fought, and a victory on Northern soil conceivably could bring about a negotiated end of the war. Lee's objective, to seek and destroy the Union Army wherever he can. But the North's General George Meade also understands the importance of victory. He knows he has to stop Lee's northern invasion at all costs. Both armies have their orders. Kill as many enemy soldiers as possible. During the summer of 1863, military thinking was much more concerned with destroying the enemy rather than occupying ground. The only question now is, where will this intense battle play out? Gettysburg a quiet town in Pennsylvania that finds itself in the wrong place at the wrong time. The Battle of Gettysburg was really an unplanned event brought about by the fact that this is where the soldiers ran into each other. The soldiers were here because the roads brought them here. There were really no ramifications to losing or winning the town 
the ramifications would come from losing or winning a battle. Once the fighting begins, it continues for three brutal days and leaves almost 60,000 dead. Today, cannons still spot the landscape, fences still trail the countryside, and according to some visitors, so do the spirits of dead soldiers. But are these soldiers still at war on this battleground? Civil War reenactor Ken Gerhardt believes the answer is a resounding yes. One night, I had a traumatic experience on the battlefield. I went out to the Grove with a couple other storytellers. I was in a Confederate uniform, and we went down to the area where a lot of Ohio men were massacred. And one of the other ladies that was with me convinced me it would be a good idea to play Dixie on my jaw harp to get a response out of them. The response Ken receives is unlike anything he'd ever expect. It was a debilitating blow to my stomach. It wasn't a physical bullet, but it felt like one. It dropped me to my knees, screaming in pain. My two friends heard it. They came running over, and they picked me up. As they were dragging me away from the wood line, I heard a voice telling me, you knew what you did was wrong, but you did it anyway, so don't you come back until you've learned your lesson. I think it was one of the Ohio men that were massacred. In light of their situation, it was absolutely the wrong thing for me to do. And it taught me a valuable lesson that they can hurt us. Why are soldiers attacking visitors to the battlefield? The answer might be found in the very nature of the battle itself. When 95,000 Union soldiers and 75,000 Confederate soldiers charge at one another, the only certainty is a bloodbath. These soldiers faced a scene of just stark brutality and violence. They fought at close range, weapons that inflicted horrific wounds. The noise was deafening. Screams of the wounded would have almost overridden the sounds of the battle and casualties build up rapidly on both sides. So it was a scene of horror. The lives were lost within seconds, and it wasn't one or two. It was hundreds of men being killed at once. That creates perfect storm in my mind to enable spirits to walk the battlefield. Their spirits are trapped because of the horrendous way they died. I think there are still spirits roaming the battlefield, still fighting the battle. One soldier was quoted as saying, we will fight them until hell freezes over. Then we will fight them on ice. Are these soldiers carrying out this promise to fight for all eternity? Paranormal investigator Lori Hall brings a voice recorder to the battlefield to find out. I was walking on the battlefield and I saw a Confederate soldier. There was just something about him and I knew he wasn't a real person. I looked right at him and said, what are you doing here? And I did record a voice. The voice said, I'll shoot you. I rewound it a bunch of times and listened to it to make sure it was really what I thought I heard. Like many people who have visited this battlefield site before her, Lori believes that spirits are still fighting after all these years. But if that's true, just how far are they willing or able to go? Ken Gearhart finds out when he crosses paths one evening with another visitor. As he walked up, I saw this guy was crying and all he did was turn around, lift up his shirt, and there were red scratch marks that were forming into welts. 
The visitor was held down face first for over a minute. When he turned to fight back, there was no one there. That's when he said he felt someone grab him by his wrist and began to drag him down the hill. And the area that he was being dragged towards, he said he looked over and saw an actual pit dug out of the ground with a whole bunch of Confederate soldiers reaching up for him, trying to grab a hold of him. And then some unforeseen savior grabbed his other wrist and jerked him back up onto his feet. And as soon as it all began, it was done, and there was no one out there. Later, I realized that that whole field was littered with mass burial pits after the battle was over. They were just digging holes and throwing the men around the hole into it and going to the next one. 160,000 troops fought at the Battle of Gettysburg. 51,000 were killed, including nine generals. Is the sheer volume of bloodshed responsible for all the violent unrest? Gettysburg seems to stand out as the most brutal affair they experienced during the war. Just sheer exhaustion. The end result was a nearly uncontrollable piece of ground that became littered with bodies. It's difficult to imagine the look of a Civil War battlefield when the shooting stopped. When the guns went silent, the air was as filled with moans and screams of the wounded. Both Union and Confederate dead were buried pretty quickly in makeshift graves where they had fallen. There are soldiers that have not been identified by anyone, and they just want people to know who they are. The mass burials may be a clue to some of the sightings experienced at Gettysburg. But as we'll see, the paranormal activity is not limited to the battlefield, nor to just soldiers. Of all Civil War battlefield sites, Gettysburg reports the highest incidence of paranormal activity. Haunted history is investigating why. The clues may lie in the history, not just of the battle, but of the town itself. 1,000 yards from the battlefield, visitors report unusual activity in the basement of this museum. different feelings felt down in the cellar. There are times when you go down those stairs and the heaviness of the room will overtake you. It feels as though you're being watched and it's not by a nice person. Moving shadows back and forth constantly. Others have felt a pinching in their shoulder or a knuckle being ground into the back of our muscle. It has to be Rosa because of all the horrible things she did to those kids. To understand who Rosa is and what's behind these phenomena, we must return to the battlefield and the death of a Union soldier. When Sergeant Amos Humiston was shot and fell mortally wounded, his last hours were spent clutching a photographic image of his three children. The photo is published nationwide, and a search begins to identify the fallen soldier. Soon after, the mother of the three children steps forward, giving Gettysburg a much needed feel good story. Then the Homestead Orphanage is open to provide food and shelter for hundreds of children in Gettysburg left parentless after the war. The orphanage was envisioned to offer children the opportunity to live in some wholesome conditions and at the same time be provided with an education. The orphanage's first headmistress is a much beloved figure in Gettysburg. People in town loved her. She took great care of the kids. They were well fed, well clothed. Things change when a new headmistress arrives, Rosa Carmichael. Another dark chapter in the history of Gettysburg is about to begin. While I 
think Rosa Carmichael may have been the right person for the job when she began working. At some point in her tenure at the orphanage, Rosa Carmichael seemed to have become mean and vindictive toward the children. Mean and vindictive turns to outright cruelty, and with no legal supervision, the children are horribly abused. She locked them in the outhouse. She would tie them to fences and leave them in the hot sun. If you can think of something terrible to do to a child, she did it. Which brings us to the epicenter of her cruelty. This is the room that terrified the children most. The saddest part of the story of the orphanage took place behind this door. This is where Rosa Carmichael would bring the children. You can just imagine her opening this door. And little children standing by were then led down this hallway. Once they got down here, they were taken into a small room. The door was closed, and they were locked in there for days. Terrified and alone, the children are at Rosa's mercy. Rosa Carmichael would run the orphanage with an iron fist. She would take them down in the cellar, chain them in the dark, and the inspectors would come to check out the children. Those children were hidden away, so no one would know what was happening there. Society would slowly be kept away from what she was doing. An unfair fight becomes more lopsided when Rosa recruits a young assistant known only as Stick Boy. Rosa Carmichael had a teenage boy that would actually mete out a lot of her punishments to the children. He had a stick, and he would definitely trip children, poke them, beat them, put them in barrels of cold water from the well out back, chained to the wall. They weren't allowed to come out. Many employees in the museum have had experiences with Stick Boy. I experienced the smell of putrid eggs sewer smell. And I almost got sick. It was so, so pungent. So I quickly went next door and told them about this. And my manager went over to see if he could smell the smell. And he came back and said, Kendra, I, I don't smell anything over there. Maybe you've got someone following you around. Could Rosa's henchmen still be patrolling the area? A paranormal expert is brought in to find out and has a frightening encounter. He looked to the back room and he saw a young man about 16 years old in a checkered shirt and wool pants, and he had a stick in his hand. He was glaring at them, and he was slapping the stick in the palm of his hand. Nobody could see him but the medium, and the medium had said, there's a very angry young man at the back of the room. Multiple experiences like Kendra's have been reported at the site of the orphanage. Visitors often bring toys as a sign of respect with disturbing results. A few months ago, this doll showed up. I took it upstairs, put it in our gift shop, and my wife, the manager, put it back in the showcase. A couple weeks later, mysteriously, it showed up down here in the cellar. And the oddest thing of all was the doll was not intact. For some reason, the arms and the legs had been ripped off of the body. Perhaps the ghost of Rosa Carmichael wasn't so fond of the children having something this nice and decided to destroy it to make sure no one plays with it again. Rosa's grip goes beyond the tortured children to the unlucky few who dare to speak her name. Whenever I would begin talking about what Rosa did, it would just feel like this intense pain in my gut, as if someone almost reached their hand in, grabbed and twisted, to the point where I could hardly continue the tour. The pain hurt so bad. But the moment that I would stop talking about what Rosa did to these children, that pain would go away. After the war, many orphanages are built throughout the country, bringing a sense of hope for future generations. But in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the horrors of war continue and the dead still linger. 
When the Civil War ends in 1865, there are approximately 20,000 children with no home or guardian. The Homestead Orphanage in Gettysburg is built to protect many of these children. But under the ruthless watch of Rosa Carmichael, many kids are beaten, starved, and chained in the basement. After the orphanage closes in 1877, there are numerous reports of paranormal activity. A lot of times a toy will move. Things have fallen off shelves. A lot of times you'll see something like a marble roll uphill or a penny move across the toy table. Are the suffering children still trying to be heard? And is someone trying to keep them silent? I brought a group down into the cellar, and I used to close the door at the top of the stairs to give them the impression of what it would be like to be locked down in the cellar as a child. Soon the presence of ghostly children is felt by the visitors. They were having this feeling of someone sitting on their lap or playing with their hair. And then I said, we have to go upstairs in a few minutes. And when we go up, we'll ask the kids' spirits to come with us. But when Kendra opens the door, she makes a chilling discovery. I turned the knob and the door wouldn't open. The tension in the room built. I tried to call to the other guide in the building, but he couldn't hear me at all. Panic fills the room until someone opens the door and frees the visitors. Rosa didn't want me to go upstairs with the kids. Rosa's reign of terror lasts for almost nine years before the truth finally comes out. There was a child that was found outside, locked in an outhouse. And because of that child, they would then start to investigate the things that he said were going on in the building. In 1877, Rosa Carmichael is dismissed from the orphanage and charged with child abuse. Her punishment, a fine of just $20. The whereabouts of several of the children are never accounted for. It is believed those that were forgotten died in the basement. The whole episode with Rosa Carmichael's brought a great deal of negative publicity and very quickly led to the closing of the orphanage. Rosa Carmichael left Gettysburg, and I don't know what became of her. Rosa is never seen alive in Gettysburg again. It is believed the spirits of Rosa, Stick Boy, and the children still roam this building today, trapped between worlds. But the unexplained phenomena doesn't end there. Just down the street is the Jenny Wade House, perhaps the most haunted structure in all of Gettysburg, and possibly ground zero for the paranormal activity in this historic site. The Jenny Wade House here in Gettysburg, the first thing I need to tell you is Jenny Wade never lived there. That was not Jenny Wade's house. It was her sister's home. When the battle started, Jenny decided it'd be better to get as far away from the fighting as possible. So she packed up and headed to her sister's house. They thought everything was going to be better there, but unfortunately, the Union Army retreated right past her sister's house. They're trapped right in the middle of the fight. Jenny's family is caught directly in the crossfire. Instead of hiding, Jenny spends her days baking bread for the Union soldiers. It's a decision that will cost her her life. She left the parlor door open, and a stray Confederate bullet fired from about 800 feet away. The bullet went in her back. It went right through her heart, got tangled in her corset as it exited the body killed her instantly. Jenny Wade is the only civilian killed during the Battle of Gettysburg. Today, a flag flies at her grave 24 hours a day, an honor bestowed on only two women in American history, Jenny Wade and Betsy Ross. But at the Jenny Wade house, nothing has been laid to rest. And the mystery that began with her death continues today. There was just this feeling of, I have to get out of this house right now. 
I believe she was communicating because she really wanted to know what happened to her friends and family. There's a lot of unfinished business with Jenny. For paranormal investigator Carol Starr, a picture taken in the Wade House reveals a shocking discovery. I thought I took a photo of a painting or a photograph. But in it, I see a figure of a woman with a long apron and a long skirt. I went back up into the Jenny Wade house, up into the same room. And when I walked in, I walked right up to it, and it's a mirror. And I was literally stopped in my tracks when I realized that there is something that I caught in the mirror. Experts estimate the number of civilian deaths during the Civil War to be well over 100,000, but the lone civilian casualty that day induced a state of panic for everyone involved. The Union soldiers came running in to see what they could do to help. Eventually took them down into the cellar, and that's where they remained for the rest of the battle. The time that the family spent in the cellar was extremely emotional. I mean, Jenny had just died, so her corpse is lying there on a board, and it had to be a lot of horror and fear of what might happen. At that point, they're wondering if the Confederates might win the battle, and when they emerge, find uh, their town of Gettysburg under Confederate control. According to Gettysburg tour guide Dwayne Pope, the panic and confusion from that day can still be felt in the Wade home today. One Saturday evening, I basically turned over my group to the medium. As he's talking to the group, he just stops in mid-sentence, and he said, Dwayne, do you know anybody by the name of Mary? Mary is Mary Virginia Wade, who is actually Jenny Wade. So the medium asks, is this Jenny Wade? The response is yes, this is Jenny Wade. I believe she was communicating because she really wanted to know what happened to her friends and family. For some reason, she's stuck here in the middle. I mean, she really had no idea what was going on. This was definitely Jenny making her presence known. Why is Jenny trying to reach out to the living? Could Jenny be attempting to give clues as to who killed her on July 3rd, 1863? There were over 100,000 civilian casualties in the Civil War, but only one in the Battle of Gettysburg. Jenny Wade. Today, the house where she died, less than one mile from the battlefield, is a hot spot of paranormal activity. I had a tour through the house. The only thing I could think is I do not want to go in there. I just don't want to go in. I would look around the room, and I would see a dark shape just dart around the corner, go past the window, shift behind someone. My heart was pounding. It was about the size of a man, but it just moved too quickly to get any idea of what was going on. As I would turn and look around the group, I would just keep catching it out of the corner of my eye in every single room. The biggest emotion I was feeling at that time was fear. Just this feeling of, I have to get out of this house right now. It was very much the feeling that you were not wanted here. Who is this spirit roaming the house? Many believe it's Jenny's father trying to protect her in a way he was unable to do in 1863. But other possibilities exist. Local legend has it that Jenny Wade was engaged to a local boy named Jack Skelly, who was away in the Army at the time of the battle. The last contact that any Gettysburg person had with Jack Skelly was Wesley Culp. Wesley and Jack are childhood friends from Gettysburg. When Wesley hears that Jack has been critically wounded, he visits him in the hospital. Jack Skelly gave Wesley Culp a message and entrusted him to deliver that message to Jenny Wade. At that point, Skelly realized that he wasn't going to survive his wound. Jenny Wade never got the message from Wesley Culp. 
Wesley Culp would die at the Battle of Gettysburg, shot down on the very property he grew up on. Jack Scully would never survive the hospital, and his letter would never reach Jenny. The lives of three childhood friends were taken by war, and today, people believe each of them may still be here. But who killed Jenny Wade? Our investigation leads us to the Farnsworth House, a Confederate stronghold during the Battle of Gettysburg. After gaining an early advantage in the battle, the Confederate Army pressed on into the town of Gettysburg, overrunning homes like the Farnsworth House and using them as forward operating bases. Today, the echoes of war can still be heard. I would say one of the most extreme cases that I've ever had in the Farnsworth House was the very first time that I ever stepped into it. I felt a presence coming closer and closer towards me. When I turned and I looked over my shoulder, I saw no one there, and that's when I felt a set of hands come down and touch my shoulders. I completely believe that it was the spirit of one of the soldiers that had died in the house. The basement of the Farnsworth house is used as a triage unit, and in the attic, a sniper post is set up. It is believed that this post is where the bullet that killed Jenny Wade was fired. The bullet came from the south-facing window of the Farnsworth house, traveled about 200 yards, and went through two doors, went through her back, pierced her heart, killing her instantly, and lodged her in her corset, and she fell to the floor with nothing but a thud. But could the shot from one sniper be the source of so much unexplained activity? It turns out the violence in the Farnsworth house runs much deeper than a lone gunman. The Farnsworth house is basically in the center of it all. A lot of people ask where the battlefield is, and it's like you're standing on it. I've had several people on tours hear someone say, get ready, or they'll hear the guns getting ready to fire. Civil War reenactor Ken Gearhart believes he had direct contact with one of these dead soldiers. As I brought the people up into the attic, I would say probably about 10 minutes into the presentation up here, I was just talking to the group. I was pointing out the sharpshooter's position. I glanced over, and in that amount of time, I saw standing above the partition door from the waist up, a Confederate soldier staring at me, plain as day. When I glanced over, he was standing just like this, just staring at me. I wasn't afraid. More than anything, I was surprised at how clearly I was able to see him. Every feature of his seemed like it was electrified, shining from the inside out. I did a double take, and when I looked back, he was gone. The identity of the man who shot Jenny Wade remains a mystery to this day. But the mysterious haunting of the Farnsworth house goes beyond the shooting of Jenny Wade to the basement, where a gruesome past plays out in the present. The Farnsworth House becomes a Confederate stronghold during the Battle of Gettysburg, with soldiers using the attic as their sniper post. It's also from where a shot is fired, killing Jenny Wade, the only civilian who was a casualty of the Battle of Gettysburg. Today, the Farnsworth House is one of the most haunted inns in America. But not all of the haunted history of this inn can be traced to the attic. It is the basement of the Farnsworth House where true horror of war played out in agonizing fashion. We were sitting in the cellar. It was just myself and a guest, and we actually heard moaning like they were in pain. It was very faint, but then it just kind of died out, and we kind of looked at each other and said, did, did you just hear that? And we both had. I think that it's part of the amputations or the surgeries. In addition to those killed in battle, 30,000 men are wounded at Gettysburg. For them, the outlook is grim. Makeshift hospitals are set up anywhere medics can find space. In the town of Gettysburg, one of the most gruesome hospitals is in the Farnsworth House basement. 
The screams still heard today originate with the lead bullets of Civil War era rifles. During this battle, the most common wounds were the result of gunshots. And the end results were devastating, gaping wounds. If you were hit in your extremities, there was a strong possibility that arms or legs were shattered. And for the medicine of the day, the prescribed treatment for that was amputation. In addition to the damage inflicted by gunshot, the lead from the bullets enter the bloodstream, leading to horrible infections that need to be treated quickly, but rarely are. Field hospitals would have had a trained physician or two, and all these physicians they tended to refer to as surgeons, but they weren't surgically trained like we think of as a surgeon today. They were valued on their speed with which they could conduct an amputation. The definition of surgeon in 1863 might more accurately describe a carpenter today. Surgeons didn't know anything about internal medicine, so they would just take out a saw and cut off the soldier's arm or legs. Soldiers were actually in that building suffering, you know, with those surgeries and dying. And the body parts were just thrown out the windows and the doors. So picturing that building today, it's hard to imagine the suffering that went on with the soldiers. And that possibly led to some of the hauntings that go on now. The suffering in this building would be difficult to overstate. Death rarely came quickly or easily, and at the Farnsworth house, the dead have long memories. What keeps these spirits here? It was the bloodiest battle in the Western Hemisphere. Can you just imagine that? 51,000 dead and dying. I believe they're drawn to the Farnsworth house because they have a story to be told. Every location that succumbed to the Battle of Gettysburg has haunting reminders of the damage done from this deadly battle that took place for just three days in 1863. A home for the Gettysburg orphans turns into a house of horrors. The site of the only civilian death and the sniper post where she was shot from, now both hotbeds of paranormal activities. All these events connected by one battle on one piece of land. But what makes Gettysburg so different from other battle sites? Is there something about the land that allows the spirits to manifest? We must return to the battlefield to find these answers. I've traveled all over the country and I've been to a lot of haunted places, but I feel something different here in Gettysburg. If you go out onto the battlefield any day, any night, there's always a possibility of having some kind of paranormal experience out there. While the battle fought here seems to be an obvious starting point for the supernatural activity, reports of the paranormal stretch further back into history to the 1700s when the land was populated by Native American tribes. The Native tribes used Gettysburg land for hunting grounds. The Native Americans did not like the rock formation of the Devil's Den. They felt spiritually that it was an evil force. It held evil within it. Many assume the name Devil's Den comes from the brutal nature of the battle, but in fact, the name predates the war. Uh, here we are uh, amidst the boulders in front of Devil's Den a rock formation that's been here for eternity. Its name was derived locally, and it came from the 1830s, where a couple of boys from town were out here playing around, as boys are prone to do, crawling into the crevices among the boulders. And uh, in the course of their antics, they found a large black snake, the biggest any of them had seen named it the devil, and referred to the place they had found it as Devil's Den. The name stuck and was commonly used in this area before the battle and certainly is now associated with it after the battle. 
Both Native Americans and the early settlers were wary of these rocks. Perhaps they knew this future battlefield was ripe for paranormal activity. Or maybe there's something in the ground itself that adds to its mystery. The land around Gettysburg and the Devil's Den has a lot of granite limestone shale rock. And the limestone can be a catalyst. It's, it does help to create the energy that enables a spirit to appear. Paranormal experts have long viewed limestone as a conductor of supernatural energy, but it's limestone's physical properties that helped make Gettysburg such a bloody battle. The open flat fields provided no cover for the Confederate charge, and the hard earth made digging trenches impossible, ensuring a bloodbath for both armies. So you have a combination of the rock and just a horrific battle of three days that killed so many men so tragically and so suddenly. It's pretty much a perfect storm that they all come together and enables apparitions to still walk out on the battlefield. When the Confederate and Union armies met at this seemingly random spot, the course of American history was forever altered. Now, 150 years later, the effects can still be felt. 51,000 dead and dying. There is a lot of energy here. These spirits like Rosa Carmichael and Jenny Wade are now trapped on Earth. Rosa believes those children belong to her. She's not gonna let them out and have a message for the living. There's a lot of unfinished business with Jenny. Why do ghosts from a long ago battle continue to contact the living? What is it about this battle and this town that continues to produce paranormal accounts that defy conventional logic? The three-day intense battle that was fought here combined with the natural energy resources in the area creates the energy that allows the manifestations of spirits to continue to today. So far, Gettysburg has been unable to answer all the questions that haunt the town. Perhaps someday, the full mystery of this horrific battle will be solved and all its victims can rest in peace.